Section 8 of 11 Possible Cases by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Monty Spinero. 11 Possible Cases by Various. Section 8. A Lion and a Lioness by Joaquin Miller. Chapter 4. I half arose and felt for my trusty six-shooter. This pistol was not one that had been purchased for this or any other occasion, as the worthless pistols of the time are usually purchased, but it had been my companion from boyhood. As I half arose, the lion suddenly halted. He lifted his proud head higher still in the air, and to my consternation, half turned about and looked straight in my direction. Then a sideways and circuitous step or two with his long reach of hinder leg, his wide and deep and flexible flank, slow and kingly, splendid to see. I sank down again, quite willing to let him interview the land of Arabs in the black chasm below. They had spears and guns and everything down there, everything but courage to face a lion with, and I was not going to interfere with a fight which at the first had promised to be entirely their own. But this new movement of mine only accentuated his graceful motion. The head now turned in the air like the head of a man. I had time to note, and I recorded with clarity, that the massive head and the tumbled mane towered straight above the shoulder. In fact, the lower part of the long mane looked most like the long shaggy beard of a man falling down upon his broad breast. This I noted as he still kept on his sideways circuit above us and around us on the yellow sand and under the yellow moon. At times he was almost indistinct. But the carriage of that head, there was a fine fascination in the lift and the movement and the turn of that stately head that must ever be remembered, but can never be described. As he came nearer, for his sideways walk was mainly in our direction, I saw that he, too, was yellow, as if born of this yellow world in this yellow night. But he was a more ponderous yellow, the yellow of red and rusty old gold. At times, he seemed almost black, and all the time terrible. In half a minute more he would be too close for comfort. I decided to arouse my companion. She wakened fully awake, if I may be allowed to express a fact so awkwardly. You know that there are people like that. What is it? A lion. Are you sure? Certain. Where? Right before your eyes. Why, I see nothing. She had looked and was still looking far out against the yellow horizon where her eyes had rested when she fell asleep. And as she looked, or rather before I ventured to point her to the spot almost under the tomb where the lion strode, he passed on and was by this time perhaps almost quite under the great slab of granite where we rested. I was about to whisper the fact in her ear when I fancied I felt the whole tomb tremble. Then it seemed to shake, or rather rumble again. Then again it rumbled. Then again. Then there was a roar that literally shook the sand. I heard the sand sift and rattle down like drops of rain from where it lay in the crevices as I listened to find whether or not 
he was moving forward toward the place by which we had ascended. He was surely moving forward. I felt rather than heard him move. I assert, and I must content myself for the present but with merely asserting that you can feel the movements of an animal under any circumstances, and I assert further that an animal, especially a wild beast, can feel your movement under almost any circumstances. The undeveloped senses deserve a book by themselves, but just now, with the largest lion I ever saw coming straight upon me, is hardly the time or place to write such a treatise. Pistol in hand, I sprang to the steep and rugged passage, and not a second too soon. His mighty head was almost on a level with the granite slab, and he was half crouching for a bound and a spring upward, which would perhaps land him in our faces. I could see, or did I feel, that his huge hinder feet were spread wide out and sunken in the sand with preparation to bend all their force toward bearing him upward in one mighty bound. I fired, fired right into his big red mouth, between two hideous pickets of ugly yellow teeth. He fell back, and then, gathering his ferocious strength, he bounded up and forward again, this time striking his left shoulder heavily against a projecting corner of the granite slab, Fortunately, the ascent was slightly curving, so that the distance could not be made at a single bound without collision, else had we both surely been destroyed. Again, the supple and comely beast, disdained to creep or crawl, made a mighty leap forward, but only to strike the rounding corner of the great granite slab and fall back as before. But I knew he would reach us in time, and if ever man did wish for fitting arms to fight with and defend woman, it was I at that time. True, I had five shots left, but what were they in the face of this furious king of beasts? I began to fear that they would only serve to enrage him. Still, he should have all I had to give. Death is, has been, and will be. The best we can make of it all is to try and see that we shall not die ingloriously. The woman had been at my side all this time, and now, as the lion paused as if it gathered up the broken thunderbolts of his strength, she laid a hand on my arm, never so gently, and said, Let me go down and meet him face to face. I think he will not harm me. Madame, I exclaim impetuously, you will meet him up here and face to face soon enough, I think. No, that will not do. You must trust the lion, as Daniel did. I pushed her back as she tried to pass down, almost violently. There, I cried, as I wheeled about and forced her before me for an instant. If you have real courage, leap to the head yonder column, then on to the next. Quick, be brave enough to save yourself, and no, I will not run away and leave you to die. For God's sake, you will run away and save me. Why? How? I will join you there. Go, quick, or it will be too late. Another leap of the lion. Bang, bang. This time he did not fall back, but held on by sheer force of his powerful arms, his terrible claws tearing at the granite slab as they hung and hooked over the outer edge. Bang! 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 The last shot. I hurled my revolver in his face, for he had not flinched or given back a single grain. His breath and my breath were mingled there in the smoke of my pistol. I heard, or did I feel, his great hinder feet fastening in the steep earth under him for his final surge to the top. I turned, saw that she had reached the farther column, and with a three leaps and a bound, 
I had crossed the granite slabs and stood erect on the nearer one. Not a moment had I left. The lion, with great noise of claws on the granite, came tearing to the surface. I crouched down, out of breath, on the outer edge of my column, so as to be surely out of reach of his ponderous paws. I expected him to decide the matter at once, to reach us, or to give up instantly. But he seemed in no haste now. He scarcely advanced at all, for what seemed to me to be a long time. Finally, jerking his tail like the swift movement of a serpent, he strode along the farthest edge of the granite slab and seemed to take no notice of us whatever. Blood was dripping from his mouth, but he did not seem to heed it. Once more he strode his old majesty, and seemed ashamed that he should have descended in the indignity of a struggle to gain the place where he now stood sullen and triumphant. Enraged, he was choked, dying with rage, and yet the kingly creature would not even condescend to look in our direction. Why? I could feel his fearful rage as he now walked on and around the edge of the granite slab. At length, he came opposite to where I lay crouching on the farthest edge of my column. He passed on without so much as turning his eyes in my direction. And yet I felt, I felt anew, as distinctly as if he could have talked to me and told me that he was carefully measuring the distance. When the lion, in his stately round, came to the narrow pass by which he had ascended, he paused an instant and half lowered his head. Ah, how devoutly did I pray that he would be generous enough to descend to the sand and gracefully present us with his absence. But no, lifting his huge head even higher in the air than before, he now passed on hurriedly came on around to where in his stately majesty he stood with quivering flank and flashing eyes almost within reach of me. Yet he still disdained to even so much as look at me. His head was far above me as I crouched there on the farthest edge of my column. His flashing eyes were lifted and looking far above and beyond me. Maybe he was on the lookout over the desert for the coming of his companion. Soon, however, he set his huge paws on the very edge of the great slab on which he stood, then suddenly threw his right paw out toward me and against the edge of my column with the force and velocity of a catapult. I heard the sharp, keen claws strike and scrape the granite as if they had been hooks of steel. Then he threw himself on his breast and hitched himself a little to one side. He threw his right paw so far it landed full in the center of my column, atop and tore a bit of my coat sleeve. Then he hitched his huge body a little farther on over the edge and again threw his huge paw right at my face. It fell short of its mark, only a few inches, as it seemed to me. But having hastily gathered in my garments, his claw did not find anything to fasten on, and they drew back empty. At this point, three dusty etchings stood out against the golden east on the yellow sands, and looked intently at us with their enormous heads high in the air, and now the beast slowly arose and moved on. A lion's head seemed always disproportionately large, but when he is exercising for an appetite to eat you, it looks large indeed. The monster who was occupying the platform with us surely saw his followers. Indeed, he must have seen them long before. But his unbending dignity seemed to forbid that he should take any heed of them. The newborn hope 
that he would descend and join his followers died as he came on around. And now something strange and notable transpired. This one incident is my excuse for thus elaborating this otherwise passive and tediously dull sketch of this night. I had risen to my feet as the lion came on around. This woman, with a force that was irresistible, sprang to my side, thrust me behind her, and stepped forward with a single spring. She stood on the edge of the column nearest to the lion. I would have followed, but that same force, which I can now understand was a mental force and not at all a physical force, held me hard and fast to where I stood. She had let her robe fall as she sprang forward and now stood only as the hand of God had fashioned her, a snow-white silhouette of perfect comeliness against the terrible and bloody mouth and tossing mane of the lion. She leaned forward as he came on around and close to the edge of his slab. She looked him firmly and steadily in the face, her wondrous eyes, her midnight eyes of all Israel. The child of the wilderness had once more met the lion of the desert as of old. Who was this woman here? who stepped between death and me and stood looking a wounded lion in the face. Was this Judith again incarnate? Or was this something more than Judith? Was it the priestess of the prophetess Miriam back once more to the banks of the Nile? Was it the old and forgotten mastery of all things animate which Moses and his sister knew that gave her domain over the king of the desert? Or was her name Mary, that old Mary, if you will, who won all things to her side, God in heaven, God upon earth, by the sad, sweet piety of her face and the story of the holy love that was written there? The lion's head for a moment forgot its lofty defiance as she leaned a little forward. Then the tossed and troubled mane rose up and rolled forward like an inflowing sea. It never seemed so terrible. He was surely about to spring, and she too. Her right foot settled solidly back, and her left knee bent like a bow and her shapely and snowy shoulders under their glory of black hair bowed low her dauntless and defiant spirit had already precipitated itself forward and was smitting the impetuous beast full in his blazing eyes i knew that her body would follow her spirit in an instant more face to face Spirit to spirit, soul to soul, a second only the combat lasted. The awful ferocity and force of the brute was beaten down, melted like a lofty battlement of snow before burning arrows of the sun. And he slowly, surlily shrank in size, in spirit, in space. A paw drew back from the edge of the block. The eyes drooped. The head dropped a little, and the terrible mane seemed terrible no more, as slowly, doggedly, mightily, I doggedly and majestically, too. At the same time, this noble creature forced himself sideways and back a little. Then he hesitated. Rebellion was in his mighty heart. He turned suddenly and looked her full in the face once more. All the beast that was in him rose up. The terrible mane now seemed more terrible than before. With great head tossed, tail whipped back, and teeth in the air, talons unsheathed, and legs gathered under him, he was about to bound forward. 
but the woman was before him with eyes still fastened on his face she with one long leap forward drove not only her shining soul but her snowy body right against his teeth or rather she had surely done so had the lion half turned about shrank back as she leaped forward then slowly looking back with his blazing but cowering eyes feeling back his spirit still defiant but if to see whether her courage failed her in the least or her mighty spirit was still in battle armor and then he passed his companions had drawn back and into a depression in the desert where he slowly and sullenly joined them one two three four dim yet distinct black silhouettes against the yellow east then but a single confused black etching away away smaller and smaller gone i gathered her robe crossed over and letting it fall on her shoulders where she still stood looked down and after the beast i picked up my pistol from where it had fallen a few feet below and as she turned about carefully reloaded it from cartridges by chance in my vest pocket returning to the summit i found her resting on her couch at the corner of the huge slab tranquilly as if we had not been disturbed i did not speak not a single word had been uttered at this time i sat down at the feet of this woman not at her side as before and let my own feet dangle down over the edge on the side farthest away from the isolated columns neither of us spoke nor did she move hand or foot till morning end of section eight Recorded by Monty Spinero. Section 9 of 11 Possible Cases by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 11 Possible Cases by Various. The Cheated Juliet by Q. Extracted from the memoirs of a retired burglar. The house in question was what Peter the scholar, who corrects my proof sheets, calls one of the Russin Irby sort, the front facing a street and the back looking over a turfed garden with a lime tree or two, a laburnum and a lawn tennis court marked out, its white lines plain to see in the starlight at the end of the garden a door painted dark green led into a narrow lane between high walls where if two persons met one had to turn sideways to let the other pass the entrance to this lane was cut in two by a wooden post about the height of your hip and just beyond this in the high road george was waiting for us with the dog cart we had picked the usual time the dinner hour it had just turned dark and the church clock two streets away was chiming the quarter after eight when peter and i let ourselves in by the green door i spoke of and felt along the wall for the gardener's ladder that we knew was hanging there a simpler job there never was the bedroom window we had marked on the first floor stood right open to the night air and inside there was the light of a candle or two flickering just as a careless maid will leave them after her mistress has gone down to dinner to be sure there was a chance of her coming back to put them out but we could hear her voice going in the servants hall as we lifted the ladder and rested it against the sill she's good for half an hour yet peter whispered holding the ladder while i began to climb but if i hear her voice stop i'll give the signal to be cautious i went up softly pushed my head gently above the level of the sill 
and looked in it was a roomy place with a great half tester bed hung with curtains standing out from the wall on my right the curtains were of chintz a dark background with flaming red poppies sprawling over it and the further curtain hid the dressing-table and the candles upon it and the jewel case that i confidently hoped to stand upon it also a bright brussels carpet covered the floor and the wallpaper i remember though for the life of me i can't tell why was a pale grey ground worked up to imitate watered silk with sprigs of gilt honeysuckle upon it i looked round and listened for half a minute the house was still as death up here not a sound in the room or in the passages beyond with a nod to peter to hold the ladder firm i lifted one leg over the sill then the other dropped my feet carefully upon the thick carpet and went quickly round the bed to the dressing-table but at the corner and as soon as ever i saw round the chintz curtain my knees gave way and i put out a hand towards the bedpost before the dressing-table and in front of the big glass in which she could see my white face was an old lady seated she wore a blaze of jewels and a low gown out of which rose the scraggiest neck and shoulders i have ever looked on her hair was thick with black dye and fastened with a diamond star the powder between the two candles showed on her cheekbones like flour on a miller's coat chin on hand she was gazing steadily into the mirror before her and even in my fright i had time to note that a glass of sherry and a plate of rice and curry stood at her elbow among the rouge pots and powder puffs while i stood stock still and pretty well scared out of my wits she rose still staring at my image in the glass folded her hands modestly over her bosom and spoke in a deep tragical voice the prince then facing sharply round she held out her thin arms you have come at last there wasn't much to say to this except that i had so i confessed it even with the candles behind her i could see her eyes glowing like a dog's and an uglier poor creature this world could scarcely show is the ladder set against the window since you seem to know ma'am said i it is ah romeo your cheeks are ruddy your poppies are too red then i'm glad my colours come back for to tell the truth you did give me a turn just at first you were looking out for me no doubt my prince she stretched out her arms again and being pretty well at my wit's end i let her embrace me it has been so long she said oh the weary while and they ill-treat me here where have you been all this tedious time i wasn't going to answer that you may be sure it appeared to me that twas my right to ask questions rather than stand there answering them if they've been ill-treating you ma'am said i they shall answer for it my love yes ma'am would it be taking a liberty if i asked their names there is gertrude gertrude's hash is as good as settled ma'am i checked gertrude off on my thumb that's my niece for a moment i feared i'd been a little too prompt but she went on and next there's henry and the children who have more than once made faces at me and phipson phipson's in it too you know her don't i it surprised me a trifle to find that phipson was a female three times to-night she pulled my hair and the rice she brought me look at it all stuck together and sodden phipson shall pay for it with her blood my hero my darling don't spare phipson she screams bitterly if a pin is stuck into her i did it once stick her all over with pins by this i'd begun to guess what was pretty near the truth that i was talking with a mad aunt of the family below 
and that the game was in my hands if i played it with decent care so i brought her to face the important question look here i said all this shall be done when you are out of their hands at present i'm running a considerable risk in braving these persecutors of yourn dearest madam the ladders outside and the carriage waiting hadn't we better elope at once she gave a sob and fell on my shoulders oh is it true is it true pinch me that i may awake if this is but a happy dream you are ready this moment there's just one other little matter ma'am your jewels you won't leave them to your enemies i suppose this was the dangerous moment and i felt a twitch of the nerves as i watched her face to see how she would take the suggestion but the poor silly soul turned up her eyes to mine all full of tears and confidence dearest i am old old had you come earlier my beauty had not wanted jewels to set it off but now i must wear them to look my best as your bride she hid her face in her hands for a second then turned to the dressing-table lifted her jewel case and put it into my hands i am ready she repeated let us be quick and stealthy as death she followed me to the window and looking out drew back what horrible black depths it's as easy said i as pie you could do it on your head look here i climbed out first and helped her setting her feet on the rungs we went down in silence i choking with laughter all the way at the sight of peter below who was looking with his mouth open and his lips too weak to meet on the curses and wonderment that rose up from the depths of him when i touched turf and handed him the jewel case he took it like a man in a trance we put the ladder back into its place and stole over the turf together but outside the garden door peter could stand no more of it i've a firearm in my pocket whispered he pulling up and i'm going to fire it off to relieve my feelings if you don't explain here and now who in pity's name is she you mug she's the original sleeping beauty i'm eloping with her and you've got her jewels pardon me jem he says in his gentlemanly way if i don't quite see are you taking her off to melt her or marry her for how to get rid of her else the poor old creature had halted too three paces ahead of us and waited while we whispered with the moonlight that slanted down into the lane whitening her bare neck and flashing in her jewels one moment i said and stepped forward to her you had better take off those ornaments here my dear and give them to my servant to take care of there's a carriage waiting for us at the end of the lane and when he has stowed them under the seat we can climb in and drive off to the end of the world to the very rim of it my hero she pulled the gems from her ears hair and bosom and handed them to peter who received them with a bow next she searched in her pocket and drew out a tiny key peter unlocked the case and having carefully stowed the diamonds inside locked it again handed back the key touched his hat and walked off towards the dog-cart my dearest lady i began as soon as we were alone between the high walls if the devotion of a life her bare arm crept into mine there is but a little time left for us in which to be happy year after year i have marked off the almanac day by day i have watched the dial i saw my sisters married and my sisters daughters and still i waited each had a man to love her and tend her but none had such a man as i would have chosen there were none like you my prince no i dare say not oh but my heart is not so old take my hand it is firm and strong touch my lips they are burning a low whistle sounded at the top of the lane as i took her hands i pushed her back and turning 
ran for my life i suppose that as i ran i counted forty before her scream came and then the sound of her feet pattering after me she must have run like a demon for i was less than ten yards ahead when peter caught my wrist and pulled me up onto the back seat of the dog-cart and before george could set the horse going her hand clutched at the flap on which my feet rested it missed its grasp and she never got near enough again but for half a minute i looked into that horrible face following us and working with silent rage and for half a mile at least i heard the patter of her feet in the darkness behind indeed i can hear it now end of section nine section ten of eleven possible cases by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by kate fallis eleven possible cases by various the mystic crew by maurice thompson chapter one about seventy years ago a young man of strong physique and prepossessing appearance arrived at new orleans he had come from new york of which city he was a native and had brought with him a considerable sum of money supplemented by a letter of introduction to judge favart de Camartine, who was then at the flood tide of his fame it would not be fair to call our young man our hero would be the good old phrase an adventurer without taking pains to qualify the impression that might be produced hepworth coleman had his own way of looking at life fifty years later he would have been a tragedian probably a famous one but the conditions were not favourable to awakening histrionic ambition at the time when his character his tastes his ambition should have been forming what he saw that was most fascinating to him had no distinct form it lay along the southwestern horizon a dreamy mist-covered something not unlike the confines of romance hepworth coleman was rich and what was perhaps a greater misfortune he had no living kinsfolk for whom he cared or who cared for him practically speaking he was alone in the world moreover he had an imagination scott's novels byron's poetry the french romances and i know not what else of the sort had been his chief reading for physical recreation he had turned to fencing and pistol practice when i add that he was but twenty-two and unmarried the rest might be guessed but coleman was not a young man of the world in the worst sense he had not turned to evil sources of dissipation healthy vigorous full of spirit he nevertheless had sentimental longings as indefinite as they were persistent youth is the springtime when longing folk to gone on pilgrimages as old chaucer words it and it would be hard to find the young man who has not felt the vaguely outlined yet irresistible desire to wander to go over the horizon into a strange new world hepworth coleman when he was taken with this longing felt no restraint cast around him he was absolutely free had all the means necessary why should he not go where he pleased if it seems strange that he should have been attracted to new orleans rather than to the old world we must remember what new orleans was in eighteen hundred twenty no other city not even paris could at that time compare with it as a centre of genuine romance nor was this romance unmixed with lawlessness of the most picturesque kind money poured into it from a hundred sources more or less illegitimate 
besides the streams of wealth produced by cotton sugar and rice industries gambling was indeed a fine art duelling appeared more a pastime than anything else and what went on in the gilded halls and melody-filled cells may be imagined i suppose though i do not care to cast a glance that way hepworth coleman had heard much of the gay city of its warm odorous atmosphere its hospitality its social charm the smack of reckless romance in all its ways somehow the desire to go there got hold of his imagination and he went the letter to judge favart de caumartin was given to coleman by his banker who in handing it to him said i don't know the judge personally never saw him but he has done a lot of business through us he is very rich evidently very influential and certainly will be of use to you i feel that i can take the liberty of sending you to him because well he is under many obligations to the bank and is likely to want many more large favours i fancy that you'll find him a trifle eccentric but enthusiastically hospitable a creole of the creoles i judge him to be and a representative of the nabobs young coleman considered himself lucky to carry with him a document that would give him introduction to a person so renowned as judge favart de caumartin of whom he had been recently reading a good deal owing to a duel fought between the judge and one colonel sam smith of the united states army in which the latter had been killed the duel had brought out history from which it appeared that judge favart de caumartin had fought before not once only but many times and always to the death of his antagonist along with these facts were disclosed numerous picturesque details of the judge's past life with more than hints that in his young days he had been a pirate or something of the sort the account also made the most of his wealth his almost reckless liberality his eccentricity and most of all the air of mystery which still hung over his business operations all this was rich food for an imagination already thoroughly saturated with the spirit of romantic adventure and during the voyage from new york to new orleans hepworth coleman found deep satisfaction in anticipating what he felt was in store for him in every fibre of his frame he felt the assurance that he was on the way to new and strange experiences his banker had sent a letter to precede his arrival by a few days asking a friend to secure suitable apartments for mr hepworth coleman gentleman the consequence being that dark young man small but well built and handsome met him at the landing to conduct him to his suite of elegant rooms on royal street is you mr coleman sir inquired this young stranger in a musical and respectable tone of voice I look for that man a present. Yes, sir, that is my name, said Coleman briskly. At the same time, he showed by his look that he would like to know whom he was meeting. Very glad you come, Mr. Coleman. Very glad, sir, indeed. Got your rooms all prepared for you, sir? Yes, sir, they is beautiful, enchanting rooms. Thank you. I am much indebted are you the gentleman to whom mr cartwright the banker wrote in my behalf no sir not any banker write to me i been told to meet you at this place at present happy to see you miss coleman very happy there was an elegant carriage at hand waiting for our friend a negro driver in livery and a small black footman stood by coleman entered the vehicle followed closely by the young creole who had met him on the landing he saw his baggage hoisted into a little wagon to come after the carriage for some reason not exactly explained this whole proceeding affected coleman peculiarly he felt a sort of vague uneasiness as if he were passing into an atmosphere of mystery if not of danger 
as he was whirled through the narrow streets he caught glimpses of queer tile-covered houses with curious hanging galleries high walls and gloomy courts flanked these and here and there a dusky palm or a bright orange tree flung up its foliage blooming magnolia clumps filled the air with a heavy languid odour but what most attracted the attention of coleman was a company of four or five young men dressed like dandies swaggering along on one of the banquets sidewalks and singing a drinking song at the top of their voices one of these hilarious fellows made a lasting impression on our young friend's imagination he was a tall olive-skinned handsome man apparently about twenty-five strikingly dressed in a plaid coat a vest of red and black velvet grey trousers and a profusely ruffled shirt evidently he was the leading spirit of the party at all events he was somewhat in front with his black cap set well back on his shapely head while his jet-black hair fell in shining curls over his strong shoulders he was shouting forth the french drinking carol in a voice as sweet as it was loud and at the same time waving in the air a small cane the entire group looked the worse for wine their faces flushed and their eyes brilliant who is that strange-looking man in front inquired coleman of his creole companion as they passed them by that j'aimon isie gousse favorte de quémentine was the answer that fairly startled the interrogator coleman actually grew red in the face and exclaimed that judge favorte de Comartine? surely sir you are mistaken beg pardon sir that is monsieur le juge favorite de Camartine. i him know very well myself at prison coleman turned and stared back through the window at the strutting youthful figure leading the noisy rout how could that be the celebrated duellist the guardian pirate it cannot be he muttered aloud it is impossible very well mr coleman said the young creole dryly but i must inquire your pardon sir monsieur le juge favorite de quemotine is to me well acquainted i remark to you sir that there is not any mistake oh certainly sir i beg a thousand pardons exclaimed coleman pulling himself together and seeing his breach of etiquette of course you were right but i was so surprised to see the judge looking so young i had supposed he was an aged man i am astonished oh mon surly george he's not so young not so very he's hair not much grey while they were still discussing this matter the carriage stopped in front of a square heavy-looking house which painted a dull red and projecting its upper gallery over the banquet flung out on either side a heavy brick wall on whose top was a jagged dressing of broken bottles and jags it looked more like a convent than like an apartment house hepworth coleman found his suite of rooms admirable in every respect large airy luxuriously furnished his creole conductor parted with him at the door without giving his name or address and without any explanation whatever of his connection with the matter of securing these elegant apartments or with making his arrival easy and pleasant some silent and obsequious negro servants were at hand to do his bidding but he soon dismissed them while he flung himself upon a sofa and lit his pipe altogether incomprehensible to him were the suggestions of secrecy and mystery connected with his reception scarcely less so was the youthful nay boyish appearance of judge favart de comartine as if the mysterious atmosphere meant to continue growing denser it was while he lay along the luxuriant scarlet sofa smoking resting and meditating that a beautiful girl came and stood for a moment in the doorway of his chamber she blushed sweetly at sight of him recoiled violently and then slipped 
swiftly away leaving behind her a rustle of fine stuff a sparkle of rare jewels and a lingering bouquet of violets and roses coleman felt the delicious shock of her magnetic beauty thrill through him a sort of shimmering outline of her body wavered or appeared to waver in the door after she had gone so dazzling had been the effect of her fresh pure flower-like yet intensely human beauty he heard her feet tap swiftly and lightly along the hall involuntarily and with unpardonable curiosity he sprang up and hurrying to the door looked out but she was not in sight for the first time in his life he felt his heart beating unnaturally end of section ten section eleven of eleven possible cases by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Follis. Eleven Possible Cases by Various. The Mystic Crew by Maurice Thompson. Chapter Two. Evening was drawing on, sending a soft twilight into the room, when Coleman's dinner was brought in by a shy and silent old colored woman. He had not ordered the meal, nor had he felt the need of it doubtless the stimulus afforded by the unusual character of his surroundings held his sense of hunger in abeyance the old woman retired as soon as she had arranged the repast on a round mahogany table coleman found the oysters the wine the broiled fish the french bread and the black coffee excellent to such a degree that he ate almost everything before him then leaning far back in his chair he began to study the silver set from which all those good things had been taken the platter was in the form of a flounder the sugar-bowl was a frog the cream pitcher a heron the coffee-pot a pelican these curious pieces were exquisitely carved and on each was cut the name Fava de Comartine, in plain, bold letters. Even on the five-armed silver candlestick, in which burned fragrant myrtle-wax tapers, appeared that striking inscription. He surveyed the room now with a more critical eye, discovering at once that the pictures, the curtains, the carpets, and, indeed, all the articles of furniture were costly and beautiful beyond anything he had ever seen before evidently he was in judge favart comartin's house the moon was shining brilliantly when coleman went forth for a short walk in the street not many people were abroad it being the dinner hour but certain cafés were crowded with men and women who were drinking champagne and discussing the dishes on well-spread tables at the door of one of these gorgeous rooms coleman met the young man whom a few hours before he had seen leading the singers in the street it occurred to him that now was as good as any time to present his letter to the judge so he forthwith stepped near him and said lifting his hat i believe i have the honour of meeting judge favart de camartin the gentleman stared at him a moment very deliberately then with just a suspicion of a smile and with a courteous dignity wholly inimitable and indescribable doffed his queer little black cap as he spoke and who does me the honour of addressing me i am hepworth coleman of new york ah i hold a letter to you from mr phineas cartwright of the firm of cartwright and vanderveer bankers indeed i feel honoured coleman produced the letter and tendered it but not without a vague feeling of insecurity of some sort he had not expected this peculiar reserve and caution on the part of the judge 
could it be that he was to be treated as an infliction to be borne for mere policy's sake his distrust and doubt however were of short duration for the judge had no sooner read the epistle which was much longer than any mere letter of introduction than his whole manner changed he held out his hand i am charmed delighted sir he said with a slight creole accent that made his voice very pleasing i am proud to see you i hope you find your rooms agreeable coleman clasped his hand and felt that measure of relief which comes when one is suddenly lifted out of a very awkward situation the judge read the banker's letter over again with great deliberation and apparently with much concentration of mind while coleman who could not remove his eyes from his fascinating dark face stood waiting for an opportunity to say you do me infinite honour judge in quartering me in your own house i had not expected and could not expect such hospitality the judge hesitated then with calm smile remarked that whatever he could do for so distinguished a visitor would be but a small expression of the greater hospitality that he would like to bestow were he able and now he presently continued come with me to my own private apartments where we can have some quiet conversation and a smoke coleman could not fail to see that the judge was still somewhat touched with wine though the mood of wild hilarity had passed off they passed along the street until they reached a narrow blind alley into which the moonlight fell but dimly between dusky walls to coleman's surprise the judge led the way into this then up a flight of winding and rather rickety stairs to a dark hall along which they passed to what seemed a great distance at the end the judge fumbled for some time and by some means opened a low heavy door leading into a room that reeked with the odour of tobacco and the fumes of wine passing across this by the light of a dim dormer window they reached a close passageway which led to another prison-like door which the judge managed to open after a great deal of trouble the room that they now entered was exceedingly small a mere cell in extent as coleman felt rather than saw the walls damp and grimy being almost within reach on either hand stand here for one moment please said the judge touching coleman's arm until i call a servant then he stepped briskly back through the doorway and drew the solid shutter to with a hollow clang some strange echoes went wandering away as if from distance to distance above below around followed by absolute silence a faint flicker of light came from above but it seemed a reflection rather than a direct beam from the moon and the air was close heavy atrociously bad coleman stood amazed for a few moments before going to the door which he found immovable he groped around the wall only to discover that there was no other outlet end of section eleven Section 12 of Eleven Possible Cases by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Eleven Possible Cases by Various. The Mystic Crew by Maurice Thompson. Chapter 3 judge favart de caumartin's residence was a large rambling structure more like a hotel than like a private house considering that his wife was dead and that he had but one living child a daughter of seventeen it was strange that he kept up such an extensive establishment in which perhaps twenty rooms stood richly furnished but unoccupied 
it was his pleasure however and his pleasure was law mademoiselle Olympe de Camartin was greatly surprised when by merest chance she discovered hepworth coleman making himself quite at home in a remote room of the house we have seen how she showed her confusion as she stepped into the doorway and found herself face to face with the young man the glance that passed between them wrought a wonder in the heart of each i shall not say that they fell in love at first sight love cannot be so accurately traced that its origin can be exactly found out in any particular case it is enough to record that mademoiselle Olympe de camartine caught something new something sweet from that momentary gaze and shut it up in her heart involuntarily with a thrill that never again quite left her breast she was back through halls and rooms to her own boudoir her cheeks and lips rosy with excitement and a gentle tremor in her limbs that evening in the library the judge told his daughter that he had given a suite of rooms in the farthest wing of the mansion to a wealthy young gentleman from new york i have had letters from mr cartwright my banker there asking me to take care of him and this seemed the best i could do under the circumstances i did not see my way to bringing him any nearer to us we don't care to have another member added to our family eh Olympe, dear? mademoiselle de Camartine blushed she may have felt a touch of guilt because she could not muster courage to tell her father that she had already visited mr coleman i have not seen him yet continued the judge i thought it best to let him have some rest before calling upon him cartwright advises me that he is of an excellent family a man to be given the greatest attention and for my banker's sake if for nothing else i must meet the demand upon my hospitality he came a fortnight earlier than i expected but i had jules watching for him and you know jules never fails but you should have told me before father dear said mademoiselle Olympe. only a while ago while wandering through the distant wing of the house i invaded this young gentleman's apartment it surprised him evidently as much as it abashed me the obvious moral of which is replied the judge quickly that you are hereafter to be more careful about what rooms you are stumbling into as he spoke his dark oval face with its fine grave smile was almost like a boy's the flesh that lay under the skin shone through with a suggestion of some repressed stimulus as if a great passion had forced it up in his eyes an underglow so to call it smouldered with fascinating vagueness mademoiselle Olympe sat for a moment on his knee and stroked his long black hair you will stay with me to-night father dear she presently murmured coaxingly you will not go out to-night i must be gone a little while he said rising at once but just a little while she clung close to him not this night please she urged with a touching tremor in her voice oh you remember this night a year ago you had that dreadful adventure in the dark room you must not go out please for my sake do not an expert observer could have seen while this was going on a strange half worried almost fiercely concentrated expression in the judge's eyes it was as if he mightily wished to remain with his child but could not by any effort resist some powerful temptation tugging at him and drawing him away he kissed her tenderly pushed her gently from him and went out the girl cast herself upon a sofa and buried her face in her hands as a vision of that night one year before came up before her eyes some strange masked men had brought her father home far into the night white as a ghost helpless speechless apparently dead they put him down there in the room and vanished he had no wound no bruise no mark of any violence but he recovered very slowly 
and he never told what had befallen him mamselle lamp knew of her father's frequent duels and if he had been brought in dead or badly off on account of pistol ball or rapier thrust she would not have been surprised beyond measure but this mysterious performance of the masked men and the unaccountable condition of the judge were taken hold upon by her imagination and raised to the highest power of romantic meaning a year had passed and she might not have recalled the exact anniversary but for the prattle of an old servant to the effect that she had seen her master the judge marching at the head of a company of masked men himself wearing an invisible mask and a queer black velvet cap mademoiselle alamp observed that her father was flushed as if with wine and his bearing was indicative of some subtle and indescribable excitement within him when he went away she felt that something startling was going to happen soon end of section twelve section thirteen of eleven possible cases by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kate fallis eleven possible cases by various the mystic crew by maurice thompson chapter four when hepworth coleman suddenly found himself a prisoner in that close dark room he did not at first suspect any treachery on the part of judge favart de caumartin he expected that gentleman to return in the course of a few minutes but this favourable impression was soon removed by certain startling events that crowded one upon another first a low rumbling clanging sound like the beating of metallic gongs in the distance came through the walls and filled the cell then as this died away to utter silence he heard tumultuous whispering all around above below the thousand voices all seemed to be saying the same thing which presently he made out to be the words the crew is coming make ready for the crew when the whispering ended little purple lights began to flash here and there but so mysteriously glinted that he could not locate them and these were followed by phantom faces wan waxen faintly luminous appearing and fading instantly succeeded by intense darkness now hepworth coleman was a man of iron nerve an athlete in body and spirit who although full of romantic and poetic impulses was at the base of his character as brave and steadfast as a lion still even the best courage has its moment of faltering and just at the point when one whole wall of his cell was withdrawn so that he stood in the full glare of twenty brilliant chandeliers that lighted a large gorgeously decorated hall he felt the blood grow stiflingly heavy on his heart before him stood a file of fantastic figures men oddly clad and strangely armed who clashed their brazen shields together and pointed their swords at his breast on the walls of the spacious room hung weird-looking trophies skulls pictures of dead men ghastly and livid pistols swords and strange banners the floor was carpeted with heavy persian tapestry thickly padded underneath coleman stood gazing while the file of armed men perhaps platoon would be more correct went through some silent but intricate evolutions after beating their shields together and threatening him with their swords when the movements were ended one of the masters came up to him and struck him lightly with the flat of his weapon across the cheek saying in a loud whisper beware you are in imminent danger coleman took him at his word 
and instantly let go a blow from the shoulder his close-set fist met the masker's jaw with a sound of crushing pasteboard and down went the man outstretched at full length on the floor his shield and sword giving forth a muffled clang as they crossed upon the soft carpet quick as a cat coleman leaped forward and picked up the sword a beautiful rapier and assuming a defensive attitude cried out boldly come one at a time and i will fight you all the fantastic figures looked at one another with evident questioning though not a word was said meantime the fallen one scrambled to his feet and swore two or three bitter french oaths the leader rebuked him with gestures come one at a time you cowardly villains repeated coleman and i'll soon finish you all come on the first one if you dare meet a man he was terribly angry but his voice was steady and even there was a space of silence then the leader said something to one of the men who immediately cast aside his shield and advanced with his rapier it was a short conflict coleman disarmed his antagonist with ease in less than a minute another man came on and shared the same fate with the addition of a prick through the wrist of the sword-arm this was exhilarating to coleman in his exasperation at being made the butt of some mysterious trick come next he cried i want the best of you and the best is a coward come on evidently the mystic band now felt the gravity that the occasion was assuming the maskers looked to their leader don't stand there afraid sneered coleman come on and get your turn who's next one after another responded only to fare badly as yet however all had escaped without deadly hurt when the leader himself made ready to fight those who had come to grief were quietly cared for by others and all seemed to treat the proceedings as by no means startling or even unusual when the leader threw aside his shield and took off his tall plume-covered hat coleman was able to recognize judge favart de comartin more by his form and bearing than by any disclosure of his features as the judge handled his rapier all the company of maskers even the sorely wounded ones came forward to look on with eager expectation his was steel that never yet had failed to find the vitals of his opponent but on the other hand there stood coleman steadfast and alert the very picture of strength and will and the embodiment of quickness and certainty his sword bearing at its point a tiny red clot of blood they looked with straining eyes and did not feel sure of the result even with their captain as their champion come on sir and take your punishment you cowardly leader of cowards exclaimed coleman in a most exasperating tone don't stand there dreading it pluck up a little nerve and come on it is useless to say that judge favart de comartin needed no bullying of this sort to urge him into combat with beautiful swiftness and grace he sprang forward and at once took the offensive then followed sword-play that was amazing to look at each combatant showed that mastery of the fencing art which makes the weapon appear to be a part of the man so swiftly leaped the shining shafts of steel that the eye saw only fine symmetrical figures shimmering between the fighters while spangles of fire leaped from the crossing edges coleman felt at once that he had met his match the judge tingled with the discovery that here at last was a master from the first it was a fight to the death if possible neither could hope to disarm the other nor was there probability of any mere disablement ending the contest the watchers looking on in breathless suspense heard with intensely straining ears the almost magically rapid clinking of the blades 
coleman fought as if with the energy of all the accumulated romance of his recent experiences half recognizing as he parried and thrust and fainted and recovered guard the vivid picturesqueness the melodramatic unreality and yet the deadly intensity of the situation he did not know where he was or why he had been brought there the whole affair had mystery enough in it to have destroyed the will-power of any weaker man but to him while the strangeness affected his imagination there was nothing in the matter to make him falter or to weaken the force of his arm a fine glow of enthusiasm flashed indeed into his blood and with it an access of cunning grace and swift certainty of hand and eye the feeling prevailed that he had in some strange way stepped out of the real world into the world of romance and as he fought the charm of heroism fell upon him and like the knights of old he felt the strength of a glorious desperation all round him the vague spirit of dreamland seemed to hover though the hideous pictures of skeletons and cadavers gleamed real enough in the glare of the chandeliers what inspired him most however was the knowledge that he was trying his force with that of the greatest duelist in the world and one who had always killed his man there was something more that gave spirit and courage to coleman he was in some indirect way remembering the beautiful girl who had appeared at the door of his room and he half imagined that he was doing battle for the right to know more of her youth is a mystery in itself and love knows no law of origin or of progress by some cerebral slight some trick of thinking under a thought so to say coleman was making a love dream keep time to the ringing strokes of his sword a girl whose name he did not know whose voice he had never heard was inspiring him as he strained every nerve as the combat proceeded the lookers-on saw that coleman's play was new to the judge who found great difficulty in meeting and parrying certain eccentric movements that invariably ended in a thrust of lightning quickness presently the judge tore off his mask with his left hand he had to do this at the risk of his life for he could not breathe freely with it on but his great skill saved him even then nay more it came near giving him the victory as coleman lunged the agile creole leaped aside and returned quickly with a wicked thrust that barely reached his adversary's breast piercing it to the depth of a half inch now the fight took on more of passion and less of grace as if the men felt that it was to be a test of strength at last round and round back and forth this way and that they leaped and recoiled and advanced their faces one dark and beautiful as a southern night the other fair and magnetic as a new england june day fixed and staring the white froth gathering on their lips when the end came it was like nothing ever before witnessed in a new orleans duel how it happened not one of the observers could tell but the two men appeared to rush into each other's arms and then it was seen that each had run the other through that broke the charm the masked men sprang forward and separated the combatants and all began to speak at once End of section 13section fourteen of eleven possible cases by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kate fallis eleven possible cases by various the mystic crew by maurice thompson chapter five judge favart de comartin and hepworth coleman were by order of the judge himself taken to the judge's mansion where their wounds were examined by physicians and surgeons quickly summoned 
mademoiselle alente de Camartin found herself nursing two almost dying patients at the same time although she suspected that this was the result of a duel between her father and the young stranger she was not told the secret of the affair until long afterward strange to say although the judge was much the older man and was wounded much nearer the heart he recovered and was walking about in his house before coleman had even taken a turn for the better the first thing he did was to order his daughter to cease her nursing of the young man it is not proper he said for a young girl to be the nurse of a man who is a stranger mademoiselle alone blushed scarlet and was so much confused that she could not find a word to say it had been a great pleasure to her to wait upon coleman who though for the greater part of the time quite insensible of her presence seemed to respond better to her care than to the treatment of the doctors she had been having her sweet dream was in love with him indeed and the command of her father struck her like a blow judge favart de Camartine suspected the truth about his daughter and was not slow in making up his mind in the matter he gave strict orders that the hall between coleman's rooms and the rest of the mansion should be kept at all times locked and barred love laughs at such precautions hepworth coleman during his convalescence lay on his back and thought of nobody but mademoiselle Olympe, and when at last he was able to get up he sent for her it so chanced that the judge having got well in a measure was gone up to natchez on business mademoiselle Olympe did not go to see the young man but she wrote him a note explaining her father's wishes but he has never forbidden you to come see me when you are able to walk so far as the library she added very frankly and i see no reason why you should stay away when the judge returned it was too late to interfere as he soon discovered and he had to bow to the inevitable the mystery of the adventure with the masked men in that secret cell has never been further explained judge favart de Comartine would not consent to his daughter's marriage until he had exacted a promise from coleman that he would never divulge what he knew the truth was that coleman knew very little he tried to discover the blind alley into which the judge had led him on that eventful evening but there was no such alley to discover the whereabouts of the mysterious hall cannot be pointed out to-day although from that memorable tuesday in the spring of eighteen hundred twenty up to the mardi gras of eighteen hundred ninety one every anniversary of the mystic crew has been duly celebrated by a fantastic band that at a certain hour of the night parades the streets of new orleans i do not refer to the regular carnival societies these are but playful imitations of mystery the genuine crew as weirdly strange and mysterious as ever may be seen only on royal street a small band headed by a tall slender dark man who wears an invisible mask and a quaint black velvet cap where they come from nobody has ever been able to discover who they are is not known even to the great rex the king of the carnival hepworth coleman and mademoiselle Olympe de Camartine were married in due time and lived on royal street all their lives every year on the evening of mardi gras they were called upon to give dinner to the mystic crew thirteen in number who ate in silence with their masks on the last of these dinners was in eighteen hundred sixty that year saw the twain who for forty years had been happy together laid in their tomb side by side strangely enough there is no record whatever of judge favart de Comartin's death indeed there is a tradition to the effect that he it is who still leads the mystic crew end of section fourteen section fifteen of eleven possible cases by various 
this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kate fallis eleven possible cases by various strange adventures of a million dollars by ingersoll lockwood old new yorkers may remember dingy's famous clubhouse in lower green street from eighteen hundred to eighteen hundred fifty it was the most fashionable gambling house in the metropolis its founder alphonse dingy having been the first to introduce roulette and rouge et noir into the new world it was in eighteen hundred fifty or a little later that ill health obliged his son cyril to sell the business out he retired to his country seat at bricksburg quite a palatial residence for those days where he died shortly after leaving a round million dollars and one child a daughter daisy spite of the fact that she was popularly known throughout the country as the gambler's daughter there were several respectable young men in the place who would have been only too happy to administer an estate worth a round million with daisy thrown in for better or worse but daisy dingy knew what she wanted and it was nothing more nor less than an alliance with the most aristocratic family in the country to wit the deluries whose large white mansion at the other end of the town was as tumbled down and shabby looking as daisy's was neat fresh and well kept miss dingy therefore proceeded to throw herself at the head of one monmouth delury mentally and physically a colourless sort of an individual who for want of sufficient intellect to make an honest living passed his time going to seed with the thousand or so acres of land belonging to him and his maiden sisters hetty prudence and martha three women who walked as stiff as they talked although they never were known to discuss any subject other than the delury family when daisy's proposition was made known to them they tried to faint but were too stiff to fall over and were obliged to content themselves with gasping out what daisy dingy marry our brother the head of the delury family but it was the first idea that had ever entered the brother's head and he clung to it with a parent's affection for his first-born in a few months mr and mrs monmouth delury set out for paris with that proverbial speed with which americans betake themselves to the french capital when occasion offers they found it a much pleasanter place than bricksburg delury improved rapidly and daisy fell quite in love with him made her will in his favour contracted the typhoid fever and died whereupon the really disconsolate widower sent for his three sisters to join him they had but one objection to going that was to part company with the dear old homestead but they overcame it the day after receiving monmouth's letter which happened to be a friday and took the saturday steamer to confess the truth the deluries had been so land poor that their spare aristocratic figures were rather the result of necessity than inclination six months of paris life under the benign protection of dingy's round million made different women of them it was wonderful what a metamorphosis parisian dressmakers and restaurateurs effected in their figures they became round and plump they stopped talking about bricksburg signed themselves the misses delury of new york enrolled themselves as patrons of art gave elegant dinners and in a very short time set up pretensions to being the leaders of the american colony but remorseless fate was at their heels figaro unearthed the secret of old dingy's million and the deluries suddenly found themselves the sensation of paris the butt of ridicule in the comic papers monmouth had been in poor health for several months and this 
killed him dingy's million was now in the eye of the law divided up among his three sisters but fate willed it otherwise for the following year hetty the eldest died of roman fever and six months later prudence fell a victim to rat poison in a small hotel at grasse city of delightful odours in the south of france whither she had gone in search of balmy air for her sister martha who had suddenly developed symptoms of consumption left thus alone in the world with old dingy's million and an incurable ailment martha's only ambition was to reach bricksburg and die in the old white delury mansion it seemed to her that its great spacious rooms would enable her to breathe more easily and to fight death off for possibly another year but it was not to be she got as far as paris when old dingy's million again changed hands going this time by will to martha's only relatives twin brothers john and william winkletip produce dealers in washington street new york the will was a peculiar one as was to be expected i give devise and bequeath all the property popularly known as the dingy million to my cousins john and william winkletip produce dealers of new york as joint tenants for their lives and the life of each of them with remainder over to the eldest son of the survivor his heirs and assigns for ever provided that said remainder man shall be of full age at the time of his father's decease and shall thereupon enter the ministry of the methodist episcopal church and devote his life and the income of this estate to the encouragement of legislative enactment throughout the united states for the suppression of gambling and wager-laying in default of such male heir the dingy million was to be divided up among certain religious and eleemosynary institutions when the cablegram from paris informing them of their extraordinary luck reached the winkletip brothers they were down in the cellar of the old tenement which served as their place of business with their long jean coats on busily engaged in sorting onions as the winkletips were only a little past fifty and as strong as hickory knobs their families were quite satisfied to get only a life estate in the dingy million for barring accidents the brothers had twenty-five or thirty years to live yet true brother john had a son cyrus who would soon be of age but he was a worthless white whose normal condition was alcoholic stupor barely characterized with sufficient lucidity to enable him to distinguish rotten vegetables from sound he will die years before his father every one remarked and then the gambler's money will go where it ought to go there had been a fire next door to the winkletips about the time the good news had arrived from paris a huge warehouse had burned down leaving a brick wall towering sixty feet above the old wooden tenement in which the brothers did business they had given notice to the authorities but the inspectors had pronounced the wall perfectly safe so the two brothers continued to come and go in their best sunday clothes however for they were only engaged in settling up the old business suddenly without the slightest warning the huge wall fell with a terrific crash upon the wooden tenement crushing it like an eggshell when the two brothers were taken out from the ruins john was pronounced dead and a coroner's permit was given to remove him to a neighbouring undertaker's establishment william lived six hours conscious to the last and grateful to an all-wise providence that his worthless nephew would now be excluded from any control over the dinky million john winkletip was a grass widower his wife an englishwoman having abandoned him and returned to england and for many years he had made his home with his only other child a widowed daughter 
mrs timmins who was openly opposed to many of her father's peculiar notions as she termed them one of which was his strong advocacy of cremation he being one of the original stockholders and at the time of his death a director of the long island cremation society consequently mrs timmins gave orders that immediately after the coroner's inquest her father's body should be removed to her residence in harlem but as the officers of the cremation society held the solemnly executed direction and authorization of their late friend and associate to incinerate his remains they were advised by the counsel of their corporation that such an instrument would justify them in taking possession of the remains at the very earliest moment possible and removing it to the crematory warned by the undertakers of mrs timmins threatened interference they resolved not to risk even the delay necessary to procure a burial casket in fact it would be a useless expense anyway and consequently john winkletip began his last ride on earth lying in the cool depths of the undertaker's ice-box as mrs timmins cab turned into washington street she met a hearse but not until she had reached the undertaker's establishment was her suspicion transformed into certainty by being told that her father's body was already on its way to the crematory mrs timmins was a long-headed woman she knew the uncertainties of cab transportation through the crowded streets below canal and dismissing her cab at the chambers street station of the third avenue elevated she was soon speeding on her way to the long island city ferry this she reached just as a boat was leaving the slip misfortune number one when she finally reached the long island side she threw herself into the carriage nearest at hand crying out to the crematory five dollars extra if you get me there in time it was not many minutes before mrs timmins became aware of the fact that the horse was next to worthless and could scarcely be lashed into a respectable trot mrs timmins was nearly frantic every minute her head was thrust out of the window to urge the hackman to greater speed there was but one consoling thought the hearse itself might get blocked or might have missed a boat as again and again her head was thrust out of the carriage window her hair became dishevelled for she had removed her hat and the superstitious hibernian on the box was upon the point of abandoning his post at sight of the wild and crazed look presented by mrs timmins was she not someone's ghost making this wild and mysterious ride but the promise of an extra five dollars kept the man at his post suddenly a cry of joy escaped mrs timmins lips the hearse was just ahead of them but its driver had the better horses and half suspecting that something was wrong he whipped up vigorously and disappeared in a cloud of dust mrs timmins horse was now as wet as if he had been dipped into the river and she expected every minute to see him give out but strange to say he had warmed up to his work and now in response to the driver's urging broke into a run again mrs timmins caught a glimpse of the black coach of death in the dust clouds ahead of her the race became every instant more exciting it was a strange sight and instinctively the farmers in their returning vegetable wagons drew aside to let them pass once more the hearse disappeared in the dust clouds this was the last mrs timmins saw of it until she drew up in front of the crematorium there it stood with its black doors thrown wide open she had come too late her father's body had already been thrust into the fiery furnace the antagonism of winkletip's family to his views concerning the cremation of the dead was an open secret with every attache of the society and the men in charge were determined that the society should come out the winner they were on the lookout for the body everything to the minutest detail 
was in readiness the furnace had been pushed to its greatest destroying power and hence was it that haste overcame dignity when the foam-flecked and panting horses of the undertaker drew up in front of the entrance of the crematory the ice chest was snatched from the hearse borne hurriedly into the furnace room set upon the iron platform wheeled into the very centre of the white flames whose waving curling twisting tongues seemed reaching out to their fullest length impatient for their prey and the iron doors slammed shut with a loud resounding clangour at that instant a woman hatless and breathless with dishevelled hair burst into the furnace room hold hold she shrieked and then her hands flew to her face and staggering backward and striking heavily against the wall she sank limp and lifeless in a heap on the stone floor of the furnace room but the two men in charge had neither eyes nor ears for mrs timmins as the doors closed they sprang to their posts of observation in front of the two peepholes and stood watching the effect of the flames upon the huge ice chest its wooden covering parted here and there with a loud crack laying bare the metal case from the seams of which burst fitful puffs of steam now came a sight so strange and curious that the two men held their breath as they gazed upon it by the vaporizing of the water from the melted ice the flames were pushed back from the chest and it lay there for an instant as if protected by some miraculous aura then happened something which caused the men to reel and stagger as if their limbs were paralyzed by drink and which painted their faces with as deep a pallor as death's own hand could have laid upon them from the furnace depths came forth a dull muffled cry of help help making a desperate effort the men tore open first the outer and then the inner doors of the fire chamber as the air rushed in the lid of the metal chest burst silently open again the cry of help rang out and two hands quivered for an instant above the edge of the chest then with a loud and defiant roar the flames closed in upon it and began to lick it up ravenously the doors were banged shut and john winkletip had his way but the dingy million seemed to draw back instinctively from the touch of the worthless sigh winkletip with loud cries of joy the various beneficiaries under martha delury's will now discovered that cyrus winkletip was born on the eleventh day of august and that as his father had departed this life on the tenth day of august the son was not of full age when his father died but the law put an end to this short-lived joy by making known one of its curious bits of logic which so often startled the layman it was this the law takes no note of parts of a day and therefore as cyrus winkletip was of age on the first minute of his twenty-first birthday he was also of age on the last minute of the day before consequently on the first minute of the day before he was twenty-one this gave the dingy million to Cy Winkletip. Under constant and stringent surveillance and tutelage, Cy Winkletip was, after several years of as close application as was deemed safe in view of his weak mental condition, admitted to the ministry in accordance with the provisions of Miss Delury's will at last the wicked dingy million seemed safely launched upon its task of undoing the wrong it had done but cy winkletip's mind ran completely down in five years and he died a wretched slavering idiot 
mrs timmins was inclined to warn off the dingy million with a gesture of horror but yielding to the solicitation of her friends she consented to take title in order that she might create a trust with it for some good and noble purpose to this end by a last will and testament she created and endowed the american society for the suppression of gambling and wager-laying and then died the trustees at once began to erect the buildings called for but before the society had had an opportunity to suppress a single gaming establishment the lawyers at the prayer of mrs john winkletip mrs timmins mother fell tooth and nail upon the trust which was declared too vague shadowy and indefinite to be executed and the dingy million its roundness now sadly shrunken made its way across the ocean to mrs john winkletip of clapham common london she died last year and with her the wanderings of the dingy million came to an end she willed it to trustees for building and maintaining a hospital for stray dogs and homeless cats and those learned in the law say that the trust will stand end of section fifteen